All right, so now we begin uh, Rudolf Steiner's commentary to the Gospel of John. And with the John Gospel now, we have a very different Gospel, as I think everyone is in agreement. The other three are called synoptic Gospels because they synopsize Christ's physical doings, the physical things that he did, the miracles and so forth. Here we have a much more metaphysical version, and this says it's the Gospel according to John, but we're not sure who this John character was. This was written much later than the others, probably about 90 AD, uh, right in there, whereas the Mark Gospel, the earliest, was 65 uh, AD. So uh, this may be the John son of Zebedee, whose brother was James, who were some of the first disciples that Christ gathered to himself. Uh, but nobody's sure about this. It, it may actually be written by a disciple of the Apostle John. Um, so th that's a possibility. And then so <clears throat> we've got this idea with, with John that uh, and it, supposedly it's also the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, which I highly doubt, on the island of Patmos. Um, and then the three Johannine epistles, which emphasize the God of love. Uh, whereas the book of Revelation, and I want to look at Steiner's commentary on the, on the book of Revelation, emphasizes the God of hatred and revenge. Um, totally different ideas. So it's not likely to, to be the same person, although Carl Jung, in his answer to Job, thinks that it is the same person. It's just that there's a sort of an antiadromia, a conscious John who writes uh, about the God of love in the gospel and the epistles, and then the sort of unconscious swing back to this God of hatred. Um, it's kind of, the psyche has a kind of internal homeostasis to it. Um, okay, and then so we've got this idea of the Logos now. In the beginning was the Word, i.e. the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There's a lot going on in that paragraph. Number one is the influence of Zoroastrianism. You can tell that with Zoroastrianism, we have this cosmic vision of the universe in which a god of uh, uh, light, Ahura Mazda, has a kingdom of light and then creates a kingdom of darkness, of which Angra Mainyu, or Ahriman, as Steiner calls him, uh, is the sort of devil figure. So we have this absolute dualistic separation between light and darkness. Uh -huh. The other thing is, this was very possibly written in Alexandria, um, and uh, the influence of the, the word logos is a nod to Philo of Alexandria, who also uses the word logos as a cosmic structuring principle. That's what the logos is. But it also refers to the fact that at the beginning of the book of Genesis, when God pronounces, things happen. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the creative power of the Logos. But way back behind that, since uh, this may have been written in Egypt, is the old Memphite cosmogony, where the god Ptah, after whom Egypt is named, Hekeptah, the god Ptah creates also through the power of the word. Um, he says things, and then things come into being through the power of the word. So we have that line somewhere dimly uh, behind this, the Menphite uh, uh, theogony. Um, and so it's a, and in Heraclitus, uh, the Greek philo pre-Socratic philosopher, the Logos is a cosmic structuring principle that puts everything in its place. And um, one of the things Heidegger didn't like about this idea of identifying a single being with the Logos is that it contracts the cosmic aspect of the Logos to a being, one being who is the avatar of the Logos. But I sense very strongly Egyptian influences here, especially the trinity of Re, Horus, and Osiris. Re, the sun god, corresponding to God. And then we have Osiris, the sun, the dying and reviving sun, and then his son Horus, as the Holy Spirit who goes back and forth between them. So there are lots of influences going on here. Egyptian influences, Zoroastrian influences. Alexandria at this time was a very cosmopolitan place and was pulling in influences from all over 
uh, the global ecumeny of that time. So, and the other thing about the word is that, and this too, Heidegger talks about in his book, The Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, is that there is an abyss of difference between humans and animals. Human beings aren't just animals with rationality added on to them. Um, it's, it's not that way at all. So he says there are three different aspects of world. World is one of Heidegger's key ideas. And he says that the stone is worldless. Obviously, the stone has no consciousness and it has no conscious relationship to anything around it. It's, it's worldless. But the animal does have a world, but it's poor in the world. It, it has a poverty of world. The beetle crawling along the blade of grass doesn't see it as a blade of grass. It simply sees it as a beetle pathway toward getting nourishment. Uh, the lizard sunning itself on a rock, it just sees it as a great place to get some sunlight. If you remove the lizard from the rock, it'll try to get back to the rock. Um, so the animals are poor in the world, and they're embedded in specific umwelts, uh, specific world rounds, uh, whether it's air or fish and water or what have you, and when you remove them from those environments, uh, they cease to be at home. They're, they're a fish out of water. They just, they're not there. Whereas humans, though, have language, and because they have language, the logos, they are, they can form worlds. World formation is the fundamental nature of the human being, and what raises the human being spiritually above, uh, at the top of the chain of being, and we are at the top of the chain of being. That model has not been deconstructed uh, by materialists and Darwinists. Uh, and Steiner spends a lot of this first chapter attacking materialists and literalists. Um, we are above all other beings because we have language. Language, as Heidegger says, is the house of being. Language, and especially poets, which I think Heidegger valued more than any other kind of uh, writer or creator. Poets create new forms of being through language. Uh, and which is the house of being, and it creates new world horizons in which there is an opposition between world and earth. As he says in his famous essay on the origin of the work of art, the world is the vision that is articulated through language that has to overcome the resistance put up to it by the materials of earth. Earth is dense, it's heavy, uh, and language has to take earth and transform it into world through world formation. So that's the Logos. That, that's what the author of the John Gospel here is talking about, is in the beginning was the Word, and it's almost as though God speaks and out comes Christ as the personification of the world formation. And Christ here is building a world. He is creating a world. The emphasis in, in the other three Gospels is on the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Not so in this Gospel. Uh, it's life. Eternal life, which is another Egyptian concept, uh, e eternal life. And um, so, yeah, the emphasis on uh, so the, the kingdom versus life. And also, the time of apocalyptic literature has mostly passed by this point. It started in 160 BC, about the time of the Maccabean Revolt, with the book of Daniel and two Esdras. And there are all these apocalyptic texts, even in Mark, the earliest of these Gospels, Mark 13 has a miniature apocalypse in it. By this time, uh, apocalyptic literature is over. This is another reason why I, I don't think th this is the same John who wrote the book of Revelation. And there's internal evidence anyway regarding the book of Revelation that it's actually a, a Jewish text that some Christian has inherited and Christianized and sort of built a Christian frame around it, um, such as the 144,000 people that will be saved. That's the 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. Um, that's a suspicious number that it's 144,000. And some other aspects to it, too. So that, that, that's probably a Jewish text that's been Christianized. This, on the other hand, uh, I tend to think of the, the John Gospel as the first Gnostic text. So apocalypticism now, by 100 AD, is slowly dying out. The civilization has entered into what Spengler calls its springtime now with these Gospels. And its apocalyptic heat up is over. Now it's moving into the mysticism of Gnosticism and the theology uh, surrounding Gnosticism. This, this is more or less the first Gnostic text. Uh, and Gnosticism will come right after this. The Thomas Gospel is the first, uh, technically the first uh, Gnostic uh, text. So this is interesting. So 
we just have this being, this incarnation of the word, very much an Egyptian type of creature that just appears and he's wandering uh, through the desert. And like with the Mark gospel, the first person he encounters is John the Baptist. And so we go over here with John and then uh, John encounters him and he immediately recognizes him as the Messiah. And so uh, John the Evangelist here uh, lengthens, he's got the longest version of Christ's encounter with, uh, with John the Baptist. Uh, and this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what, what then, are you Elijah? Uh, he said, I am not. So it, it had been tr traditional that John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah, as almost, you know, his mother's name is Elizabeth. Uh, Eli the bath is house. Uh, Elisha, uh, the house of Elisha, who is the prophet who follows Elijah, Plus, Steiner insists also that, uh, from his researches into the Akashic Record, that uh, John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah. Not only that, but later on he will reincarnate as the Renaissance painter Raphael, and then after that as the German poet Novalis at the turn of the uh, 19th century there. Um, so that's his sort of karmic history for this individuality, John the Baptist. And they say, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Um, they said to him, then, who are you? Let, let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know even he who comes after me. So he's already recognized Christ. He already knows that he's one of these people. Uh, the, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. This took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And then it says, So the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. Um, I myself did not know him, but for this I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. Now note that Lamb of God. So he's characterizing him as the Lamb of God, almost as though it were a reference to Ares, uh, with regard to the procession of the equinoxes, which was moving at this time out of Ares, which it had been in for the past 2,000 years, into the sign of Pisces. And in a way, as John is about to baptize him with water, he transforms Christ into a fish. So he moves from the age of Aries to the age of Pisces. Um, but they all recognize him immediately. This, this is very different from the other three Gospels as the Messiah, uh, because it takes them a while in the three synoptic texts to recognize Christ as the Messiah. And he says, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, which Steiner says at this point then, when he baptizes him, and the dove descends. The dove is the Christ being that has come down from the sun. But it's also interesting to note that the dove was sacred to the goddess Aphrodite in the Greek world, the goddess of love, uh, erotic love specifically. I saw the spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere it says he baptizes with fire. The Holy Spirit is very often associated with fire, as in Pentecost, with the tongues of flame. Uh, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Um, all right, and then so he encounters uh, Simon, the, the same first two, the brothers, the twins, who may be the Gemini, uh, Simon Peter and Andrew, who are the brothers, um, just as in the other Gospels, these are the first two that he encounters and they immediately say, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And then, uh, but the odd thing is here, he does not encounter the Boanerges, the sons of thunder, which would be John, possibly the author of this text, uh, John the Apostle, son of Zebedee, and his brother James. Uh, this author skips over that, which I, I find to be in interesting, and he goes straight to Philip. But um, in the previous Gospels, Philip 
was the brother of Bartholomew. Um, and here, instead of Bartholomew, he encounters this individual named Nathaniel. So we have Philip and Nathaniel. Um, and I don't think Nathaniel is one of the apostles. I don't, I don't recall him being an apostle. Uh, he's not. Uh, but it's interesting how this starts. This, this prologue already is written very differently. And it's you have to consider that it, it's probably not the apostle John, because that guy was a rube, an, an illiterate rube from the hills of Judea. Um, this is obviously an individual who is very well read, probably educated uh, in Alexandria, probably knew Greek, or, or did not know Greek. Obviously, these are these are written in Greek, um, but he might have known Aramaic as well, Hebrew possibly. This is a very sophisticated individual, so I, I doubt very strongly that this is uh, the the Apostle John. Um, okay, so uh, that's the basically the the, the opening chapter of uh, Steiner's discussion here of the Gospel according to John. So we'll move on from there with chapter uh, two.